To Pay the Piper by James Blish This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Pay the Piper by James Blish Clearly, re-educating man's brain wouldn't fit him for survival on the plague-ridden surface. Re-educating his body was the answer, but the process was so very long. The man in the white jacket stopped at the door marked Re-Education Project, Colonel H. H. Mudgett, Commanding Officer, and waited while a scanner looked him over. He had been through that door a thousand times, but the scanner made as elaborate a job of it as if it had never seen him before. It always did, for there was always, in fact, a chance that it had never seen him before, whatever the fallible human beings to whom it reported might think. It went over him from gray, crew-cut pole to reagent-proof shoes, checking his small, wiry body and lean profile against its stored silhouettes, tasting and smelling him as dubiously as if he were an orange held in storage two days too long. Name, it said at last. Carson, Samuel, 32-454-0698. Business, medical director, Reed 1. While Carson waited, a distant, heavy concussion came rolling down upon him through the mile of solid granite above his head. At the same moment, the letters on the door and everything else inside his cone of vision blurred distressingly, and a stab of pure pain went lancing through his head. It was the supersonic component of the explosion, and it was harmless, except that it always both hurt and scared him. The light on the door scanner, which had been glowing yellow up till now, flicked back to red again, and the machine began the whole routine all over. The sound bomb had reset it. Carson patiently endured its inspection, gave his name, serial number, and mission once more, and this time got the green. He went in, unfolding as he walked the flimsy square of cheap paper he had been carrying all along. Mudgett looked up from his desk and said at once, What now? The physician tossed the square of paper down under Mudgett's eyes. Summary of the press reaction to Hamelin's speech last night, he said. The total effect is going against us, Colonel. Unless we can change Hamelin's mind, this outcry to re-educate civilians ahead of soldiers is going to lose the war for us. The urge to live on the surface again has been mounting for ten years. Now it's got a target to focus on. Us. Mudgett chewed on a pencil while he read the summary. A blocky, bulky man, as short as Carson and with hair as gray and close cropped. A year ago, Carson would have told him that nobody in Riyadh could afford to put stray objects in his mouth even once, let alone as a habit. Now Carson just waited. There wasn't a man, or a woman, or a child, of America's surviving 35 million sane people who didn't have some such tick. Not now. Not after 25 years of underground life. He knows it's impossible, doesn't he? Mudgett demanded abruptly. Of course he doesn't, Carson said impatiently. He doesn't know any more about the real nature of the project than the people do. He thinks the educating we do is in some sort of survival technique. That's what the papers think, too as you can plainly see by the way they loaded that editorial. Hmm. If we had taken direct control of the papers in the first place... Carson said nothing. Military control of every facet of civilian life was a fact, and Mudgett knew it. He also knew that an appearance of freedom to think is a necessity for the human mind, and that the appearance could not be maintained without a few shreds of the actuality. Suppose we do this... Mudgett said at last. Hamelin's position in the State Department makes it impossible for us to muzzle him. But it ought to be possible to explain to him that no unprotected human being can live on the surface, no matter how many merit badges he has for woodcraft and first aid. 
Maybe we could even take him on a little trip topside. I'll wager he's never seen it. And what if he dies up there? Carson said stonily. We lose three-fifths of every topside party as it is. And Hamelin's an inexperienced might be the best thing, mightn't it? No, Carson said. It would look like we planned it that way. The papers would have the populace boiling by the next morning. Mudgett groaned and nibbled another double row of indentations around the barrel of the pencil. There must be something, he said. There is. Well, bring the man here and show him just what we are doing. Re-educate him if necessary. Once we tell the newspapers that he's taken the course, well, who knows, they might just resent it, abusing his clearance privileges and so on. We'd be violating our basic policy, Mudgett said slowly. Give the earth back to the men who fight for it. Still, the idea has some merits. Hamelin is out in the antechamber right now, Carson said. Shall I bring him in? The radioactivity never did rise much up beyond a mildly hazardous level, and that was only transient during the second week of the war the week called the Death of Cities. The small shards of sanity retained by the high commands on both sides dictated avoiding weapons with a built-in backfire. No cobalt bombs were dropped, no territories permanently poisoned. Generals still remembered that unoccupied territory, no matter how devastated, is still unconquered territory. But no such consideration stood in the way of biological warfare. It was controllable. You never released against the enemy any disease you didn't yourself know how to control. There would be some slips, of course, but the margin for error... There were some slips. But for the most part, biological warfare worked fine. The great fevers washed like tides around and around the globe, one after another. In such cities as had escaped the bombings, the rumble of truck convoys carrying the puffed, heaped corpses to the mass graves became the only sound except for sporadic small arms fire. And then that too ceased, and the trucks stood rusting in rows. Nor were human beings the sole victims. Cattle fevers were sent out. Wheat rusts, rice molds, corn blights, hog choleras, Poultry enteritises fountained into the indifferent air from the hidden laboratories or were loosed far aloft in the jet stream by rocketing fleets. Gelatin capsules pullulating with gill rods fell like hail into the great fishing grounds of Newfoundland, Oregon, Japan, Sweden, Portugal. Hundreds of species of animals were drafted as secondary hosts for human diseases were injected and released to carry the blessings of the laboratories to their mates and litters. It was discovered that minute amounts of the tetracycline series of antibiotics, which had long been used as feed supplements to bring farm animals to full market weight early, could also be used to raise the most whopping Anopheles and Aedes mosquitoes anybody ever saw, capable of flying long distances against the wind and of carrying a peculiarly interesting new strain of the malarial parasite and the yellow fever virus. By the time it had ended, everyone who remained alive was a mile underground. For good. I still fail to understand why, Hamelin said. If, as you claim, you have methods of re-educating soldiers for surface life, you can do so for civilians as well. Or instead, the undersecretary, a tall, spare man, bald on top, and with a heavily creased forehead, spoke with the odd neutral accent, untinged by regionalism, of the trained diplomat, despite the fact that there had been no such thing as a foreign service for nearly half a century. We're going to try to explain that to you, Carson said. But we thought that, first of all, we try to explain once more why we think it would be bad policy, as well as physically out of the question. Sure, 
Everyone wants to go topside as soon as it's possible. Even people who are reconciled to these endless caverns and corridors hope for something better for their children. A glimpse of sunlight, a little rain, the fall of a leaf. That's more important now to all of us than the war, which we don't believe in any longer. That doesn't even make any military sense, since we haven't the numerical strength to occupy the enemy's territory anymore, and they haven't the strength to occupy ours. We understand all that. But we also know that the enemy is intent on prosecuting the war to the end. Extermination is what they say they want on their propaganda broadcasts, and your own department reports that they seem to mean what they say. So we can't give up fighting them. That would be simple suicide. Are you still with me? Yes, but I don't see. Give me a moment more. If we have to continue to fight, we know this much that the first of the two sides to get men on the surface again, so as to be able to attack important targets, not just keep them isolated in seas of plagues, will be the side that will bring this war to an end. They know that too. We have good reason to believe that they have a re-education project and that it's about as far advanced as ours is. Look at it this way, Colonel Mudgett burst in unexpectedly. What we have now is a stalemate. A saboteur occasionally locates one of the underground cities and lets the pestilences into it, sometimes on our side, sometimes on theirs. But that only happens sporadically, and it's just more of this mutual extermination business, to which we're committed willy-nilly for as long as they are. If we can get troops onto the service first, we'll be able to scout out their important installations in short order, and issue them a surrender ultimatum with teeth in it. They'll take it. The only other course is a sort of slow, mutual suicide we've got now. Hamelin put the tips of his fingers together. You gentlemen lecture me about policy, as if I'd never heard the word before. I'm familiar with your arguments for sending soldiers first. You assume that you're familiar with all of mine for starting with civilians, but you're wrong because some of them haven't been brought up at all outside the department. I'm going to tell you some of them, and I think they'll merit your close attention. Carson shrugged. I'd like nothing more to be convinced, Mr. Secretary. Go ahead. You of all people should know, Dr. Carson, how close our underground society is to a psychotic break. To take a single instance... The number of juvenile gangs roaming these corridors of ours has increased 400% since the rumors about the re-education project began to spread. Or another. The number of individual crimes without motive, crimes committed just to distract the committer from the grinding monotony of the life we all lead, has now passed the toll of all other crimes put together. And as for actual insanity... Of our 35 million people still unhospitalized, there are 4 million cases of which we know, each one of which should be committed right now for early paranoid schizophrenia, except that were we to commit them, our essential industries would suffer a manpower loss more devastating than any the enemy has inflicted upon us. Every one of those 4 million persons is a major hazard to his neighbors, and to his job, but how can we do without them? And what can we do about the unrecognized, subclinical cases, which probably total twice as many? How long can we continue operating without a collapse under such conditions? Carson mopped his brow. I didn't suspect that it had gone on that far. It has gone on that far, Hamelin said icily, and it is accelerating. Your own project has helped to accelerate it. Colonel Mudgett here mentioned the opening of isolated cities to the pestilences. Shall I tell you how Louisville fell? A spy again, I suppose, Mudgett said. No, Colonel, not a spy. A band of... of vigilantes, of mutineers. I'm familiar with your slogan, The Earth to Those Who Fight for It. Do you know the counter-slogan that's circulating among the people? They waited. Hamelin smiled and said, Let's die on the surface. 
They overwhelmed the military detachment there, put the city administration to death, and blew open the shaft of the surface. About a thousand people actually made it to the top. Within 24 hours, the city was dead, as the ringleaders had been warned would be the outcome. The warning didn't deter them, nor did it protect the prudent citizens who had no part in the affair. Hamelin leaned forward suddenly. People won't wait to be told when it's their turn to be re-educated. They'll be tired of waiting, tired to the point of insanity of living at the bottom of a hole. They'll just go. And that, gentlemen, will leave the world to the enemy, or more likely, the rats. They alone are immune to everything by now. There was a long silence. At last, Carson said mildly, Why aren't we immune to everything by now? Eh? Why, the new generations. They've never been exposed. We still have a reservoir of older people who lived through the war. People who had one or several of the new diseases that swept the world, some as many as five, and yet recovered. They still have their immunities, we know. We've tested them. We know from sampling that no new disease has been introduced by either side in over ten years now. Against all the known ones, we have immunization techniques, antisera, antibiotics, and so on. I suppose you get your shots every six months like all the rest of us. We should all be very hard to infect now, and such infections as do take should run mild courses. Carson held the undersecretary's eyes grimly. Now answer me this question. Why is it that, despite all these protections, every single person in an open city dies? I don't know, Hamelin said, staring at each of them in turn. By your showing, some of them should recover. They should, Carson said. But nobody does. Why? Because the very nature of disease has changed since we all went underground. There are now abroad in the world a number of mutated bacterial strains which can bypass the immunity mechanisms of the human body altogether. What this means in simple terms is that should such a germ get into your body, your body wouldn't recognize it as an invader. You would manufacture no antibodies against the germ. Consequently, the germ could multiply without any check, and you would die. So would we all. I see, Hamelin said. He seemed to have recovered his composure extraordinarily rapidly. I'm no scientist, gentlemen, but what you tell me makes our position sound perfectly hopeless. Yet obviously you have some answer. Carson nodded. We do. But it's important for you to understand the situation, otherwise the answer will mean nothing to you. So, is it perfectly clear to you now, from what we've said so far, that no amount of re-educating a man's brain, be he soldier or civilian, will allow him to survive on the surface? Quite clear, Hamelin said, apparently ungrudgingly. Carson's hope rose by a fraction of a millimeter. But if you don't re-educate his brain, what can you re-educate? His reflexes, perhaps? No, Carson said. His lymph nodes and his spleen. A scornful grin began to appear on Hamelin's thin lips. You need better public relations counsel than you've been getting, he said. If what you say is true, as of course I assume it is, then the term re-educate is not only inappropriate, it's downright misleading. If you had chosen a less suggestive and more accurate label in the beginning, I wouldn't have been able to cause you half the trouble I have. I agree we were badly advised there, Carson said, but not entirely for those reasons. Of course the name is misleading. That's both a characteristic and a function of the names of top-secret projects. But in this instance... The name re-education, bad as it now appears, subjected the men who chose it to a fatal temptation. You see, though it is misleading, it is also entirely accurate. 